Are you tired of the same boring sports talk shows? Has your hunger for SEC sports yet to be filled? Well, worry no longer. You have arrived in the waiting room with Dr. SEC, where the sports talk is unbiased, refreshing, and impossible to duplicate. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me on. Hey, I know it's a really busy week for you, and we appreciate you taking some time to be with us. And uh, we want to talk a little football, but before we do, there's something I believe of any, even uh, greater emphasis that's going on right now. Uh, would you tell our, our listeners uh, what you're doing and, and some of the good work that you're going to be doing in Atlanta this week? Sure. Well, you know, the, the big event Saturday with the SEC championship game, but on Thursday or Fridays preceding it the past five years, the conference and all state have partnered up for the Good Works Day. And it's in conjunction with all state and the Football Coaches Association's initiative with their National Good Works team to make sure that uh, folks are aware of and see all the good work that is done by college football players. And in this instance, former college football players. We've got uh, DJ Shockley and David Green and, and even my brother John, all National Good Works team members. Um, and also, incidentally, conference championship, uh, champions uh, in 02 and 05 participating uh, in today's Good Works Day. And uh, we're going to be at Gresham Park with Pride, uh, Park Pride Atlanta re- rehabilitating and, and refurbishing their facilities a little bit, and it's just an opportunity to give back and demonstrate what a great vehicle college football is for impacting people in a positive way. Well, I'm not going to go on my rant about how that 2002 team should have been able to play for a national championship. They were that good. That's a different time. Uh, But let me ask you, uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, several uh, former Georgia Bulldog players. Uh, Is this something, this good works team, is this something that, um, am I mistaken, isn't this something y'all picked up while at Georgia with Coach Rick? Well, Coach Rick was there. Obviously, I, I was there preceding Coach Rick, and it's a team that, that uh, has been around for quite some time. All State and the, and the Coaches Association have been together for 22 years. And it's basically the all character team. It's your senior All Americans, your academic All Americans. But this is, uh, these are the college football players that are the best, uh, best of the best. And there's a lot of great kids playing college football, but these kids have gone the extra mile. That's to put it mildly. Um, where they're starting their own nonprofits, they're working for Habitat for Humanity, they're participating in mission trips, ministries, uh, soup kitchens, you name it, really. They start their own 501c3s. That alone, to me, shows and demonstrates their commitment uh, to selflessness and, and, and trying to impact people around them positively. Uh, and that's where this team... Uh, has been around for quite some time, and incidentally, this this conference, the SEC, has contributed and had more players from its uh, member institutions and teams named to the National Good Works team than any other conference. And so not just great football players, but great kids playing good football. Now, let me ask you one more thing. Um, we've got, of course, uh, listeners across five different states, and of course, we'll also uh, have this online available as well. But for people that aren't in the Atlanta area, what can they do to help out? Well, you know, what they've done, and more than anything else, is is they can participate in whatever programs uh, at their respective institutions of, of, of that they support from a fan standpoint. And the University of Georgia uh, obviously has a great deal of community outreach. That's not unique to Georgia. In fact, um, this team recognizes not just FBS-level schools, but FCF uh, and on down all divisions. Uh, of college football and their players participate. There's programs where they can plug in, uh, but there's not a, one big overarching one because the idea is uh, to impact communities locally. The idea of this team is to recognize the kids that are making that impact on a national scale. Absolutely. Well, we just appreciate all that hard work that you're doing and just the wonderful results. I've been able to research and do reading on a couple of different projects that have taken place and really is a great thing. And we want to encourage all of our listeners that they just, uh, if they don't have time to give, they can go and give in resources, whatever the case might be. Uh, but it really is a wonderful work. Uh, we want to talk a little bit of college football with you for a minute. 
course, there's a big game this weekend, and I don't know about you, but this is about the last scenario I had going into the preseason uh, outside of maybe maybe Kentucky and <laughs> Kentucky getting in it or something of that nature. But here, here we are uh, with Auburn and Missouri in the championship game and really just uh, the most improbable game in SEC history, I believe. Uh, but, but what do you see kind of the keys of the game? Yeah, no, nobody saw it coming. You know, the key in, in this game, I think, will be can, can Missouri uh, play run defense the way they have all season versus a rush offense that's not going to give up, uh, a rushing offense that really no one else has been able to corral. And you look at the way Auburn deploys their offense, lots of misdirection, it's high octane, high pace, uh, but it's still power football. And that can not only wear you down physically but mentally, it's a challenge because there's a lot of sleight of hand in what Auburn does in their offensive backfield where they're blowing you know, perimeter players through on a, on a fake handoff on a jet sweep. And then did they hand it off to the tailback? Does the quarterback still have the football? Oh, and by the way, you know, we've got a fullback that's running downhill at, at the uncovered, uncovered defender. It's, it's a difficult offense as, as, as defenses have seen this year to defend, even though it's predictable in that it's almost always going to be a run. Uh, Missouri, uh, if they can hold up defensively and capitalize uh, on opportunities that they have, I think, in their passing game, not to take anything away with what they've been able to do on the ground this year, uh, I think their biggest advantage, uh, literally and figuratively, is at the wide receiver position. Nobody can match up with them. Uh, from the physical standpoint, they're, they're freaks out wide. And I think if James Franklin has the kind of day that he's proven uh, to be capable of throughout this season, uh, then the Missouri Tigers should enjoy a, a good bit of success offensively. I wrote in an article that came out today in the Columbia Daily Herald a lot of the things you're just talking about. I, I think the Missouri, that Missouri will find some success on offense. Of course, the question is, can they stop Auburn's offense? And I tell you, now I do believe that, in my opinion, Missouri's got a better defensive line. Even though Alabama's a better defense, I'll take Missouri's defensive line against almost anybody. But uh, were you surprised, like I was, the amount of success Auburn had running the ball against Alabama? I was, but I, I probably shouldn't have been. Uh, I mean, uh, that's the best rushing defense in the country statistically. Uh, but this is a rushing offense that uh, hasn't been stopped. And people knew that Auburn was going to run the football on them, and yet they were incapable of slowing down what they've been able to build uh, with their rushing attack this year. And even as good as Alabama is or has been, um, you know, what we've learned is that it just hasn't been good enough. And it's not for turnovers in the LSU game. I, I'm not sure that we're not talking about an undefeated Auburn football team, you know, sprinkled in with some of the magic that they've experienced the last two weeks. Absolutely. And I, I believe the same could probably be said for Missouri had it not been for a bad fourth quarter with a backup quarterback. Uh, you and, and, yeah. and the LSU game, like you said, you really could have two undefeated teams here, couldn't you? Isn't that amazing? You know, you got a 17-point lead in the fourth quarter and, and, and take, I mean, Connor Shaw, if there's a clutch performer in the conference uh, or a more clutch performer, I don't know who he is. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the fact that not only did no one see Missouri and Auburn meeting in the conference championship, but it was a, a near miss that they weren't two undefeated Auburn-Missouri teams uh, meeting in that conference championship. That's that's something that nobody would have anticipated. Now, I, I know you, you're busy and got a lot of things to do today. I want to ask you just a couple more quick questions if you got time. Uh, Nick, Mar Nick Marshall, uh, coming into the season, one of the reasons I only picked Auburn to win seven, po or seven games, and of course a lot of that was more than a lot of people had, but one of the reasons is I thought Nick Marshall would do well, but he had 20 interceptions in junior college last year. And that doesn't translate very well to SEC football. But it seems that Gus Malzahn, not only knows how to bring out a player's strengths, but he kind of knows how to hide their weaknesses as well, doesn't he? He does, and I tell you what, a lot of those turnovers were a function of, hey, Nick, you're our best player, just go out there and make a play. And he was a guy that was was not a disciplined player, and I don't think it's because he's not a disciplined kid necessarily, but he wasn't forced to play in, in a disciplined manner. It was basically you got to run out there and be reckless with the football because we need you to make plays. 
So I think that, that we got probably a little bit of an inaccurate picture of Nick Marshall uh, and, and what probably many people would have thought would be a, a guy who is turnover prone just because of what he was asked to do in JUCO. What, what I was on at Rhett Lashley, his offensive coordinator and, and play caller um, at Auburn, have been able to do is, I think, help form and shape Nick Marshall uh, in his game and, and give him a construct in which to, to operate that offense. And he has really thrived. We've seen him grow uh, as, at the quarterback position. He's not a tremendous passer. He's got a tremendous arm. Uh, but he hasn't had to be, and he's operating the uh, the uh, Auburn offense with great efficiency this year. Absolutely, I'll tell you another player that has surprised me, and I, I guess it's like you said, it probably shouldn't have. Uh, you put a good running back in a in a system that's built for running backs, uh, but Trey Mason's had a great year, hasn't he? He has had an unbelievable year, and and he's a guy that you know with the ascendance of. Uh, Nick Marshall, it's easy, I think, to overlook what Trey Mason means to this offense. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, he's still their leading rusher. And and as more than anything else, uh, he's the pacemaker for what they're doing offensively. And Nick is, uh, is, is a home run hitter, to be sure, but he's also the change-up pitch. And Mason is the one that you get the steady diet up. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you, uh, and I and I feel like probably if you if you looked all things considered, Alabama's probably the most uh, balanced team in the league as far as uh, offense and defense goes. You know, you got Georgia who has a great offense, but just had such a young defense. Florida, when healthy, had a great defense, but no offense, and and seems to be that kind of uh, going around. But Missouri, to me, seems to be uh, maybe outside of Alabama, uh, has one of the more balanced teams in the league. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. In fact, when you look at it, uh, you know, if you look at Auburn and you say balance is overrated, well, that's because you're just really good at one aspect of your offense. Uh, but you look at Missouri, and they have that capability of passing the football effectively. you got a mobile quarterback. They do have that read zone scheme as well. They don't run it nearly as often or, uh, or um, as effectively as Auburn is, but few have. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not any good at it. And that offensive front has done an excellent job with some of their zone schemes, uh, and they can get downhill on you as well and, and impose a physical presence offensively. And I like Missouri. I actually like Missouri to win this game, but this is, is, is a very close matchup, I think, between these two squads. Well, I'll tell you this way. Hey, I've uh, I've hit 93% on our website, of course. We, we put out weekly predictions. I've hit 93% the last, uh, right at it this year. It'll be three years in a row. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, Auburn's about to kill that. Two two weeks in a row, I thought Georgia was a better team on paper now that they were getting healthy. I thought Alabama was a better team on paper. This week, I think Missouri is a better team on paper, but I'm scared to death to pick against Auburn. <laughs> I don't blame you, you know. It's kind of that Bill Snyder effect. Right? You pick against them every year at Kansas State, and daggum if they got to find ways to win 10 games a year. Um, I don't blame you for being hesitant, uh, but I think maybe the, the magic has run out for Auburn. And I, and I think being away from Jordan-Hare Stadium, there's just been something. That crowd has been so electric the last few games. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, it'll be a neutral site this time around, so. Um, and we'll see how they perform in a, in a, in a dome. Absolutely. Well, Matt, we appreciate so much you being on with us, and we appreciate all the great work that you're doing with the College Football Legends team and the All-State uh, Good Works team and the great job that y'all are doing there, and we hope we can have you back on the show soon. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.